everybody. I am happy that once again you have chosen to join us in our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again to say thank you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for hearts and minds that choose to study your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask, that, as always, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors that a special providence watches over their welfare and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. John, the third chapter, verse 16, the King James Version says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, we are coming to the end of our scenic route. Thus far, it's been an amazing view. I know that I have learned some things that I didn't know, and I didn't know that I didn't know them. I don't know about you, but I have never really given Nicodemus that much thought. But now, I feel that by knowing him better, I have been able to see me a little better. Who knew? Well, there's one more view for us to see before returning to the main road. Uh, a sign on the road that simply says, why? Hmm, what could it be? We have already answered the question, why a Pharisee? What could the other why be? Can't you hear Nicodemus thinking to himself, why? Why is it all necessary? Why must the son of man be hung on a pole? I know why the bronze serpent was hung on the pole. It was so that the people that had been bitten could be healed. Can't you hear Nicodemus thinking, what does that have to do with now? Have you ever wondered, why? We all know the Sunday school answer. Jesus died to save us from our sins. And that is true. But did you ever wonder why? Why did we need saving in the first place? I guess by now you can tell that I was that kid that constantly asked why. And guess what? God Jesus and the Holy Spirit is okay with that. It's like being in Sam's or Walmart. They are notorious for moving things around. It's like they leave stuff in place long enough for you to get used to it being there. Then it seems like they will take a whole aisle and relocate it somewhere else in the store. I once asked one of the uh, people that was stocking the shelves, I'm like, why y'all do that? And the answer, when he gave it to me, it was obvious. So that, it, it was so that the customer will have to search for whatever it is that they're looking for. Causing you to have to move around the store. Because when you have to search, most people end up buying more than they came in for. It always works for me. Well, the same is true about asking questions of the Bible. It will cause us to search, which more times than not will lead to places we have not gone before and to things we have not seen. It will lead to things we need but didn't know we needed them. So our last question on this scenic route is, why was it necessary for Jesus to die for our sins? To get the answer to that question, it requires that we go back to the beginning of humans, back to Adam and Eve. 
And we all know the story. Back before the fall, life in the garden was good. There was peace and harmony with God, with the animals, and with each other. God gave them one rule, but lots of responsibilities. Genesis, the second chapter, verse 15 through 17, the NIV version. Verse 15 is the responsibility, which says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Then verse 16 gives us that one commandment. Verse 16 and 17, that one commandment. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but... You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. So they had, they only had that one don't in the whole big garden. How hard was that? They could freely eat from every other tree in the garden. Just that one forbidden tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was really for their protection, not to cramp their style. We don't know how long the good times lasted, how long between chapters 2 and chapter 3. But at the beginning of chapter 3, in enters the serpent or Satan better known as the tempter. Eve is tempted and yields and eats from the forbidden tree. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. It is also in chapter 3 that we see that God didn't just make man, put him in the garden, and then went off and did God things. God had a personal relationship with them. After they sinned and was trying to hide, God came walking in the cool of the evening looking for Adam. You get the feeling that this is the norm for the end of the day. God coming uh, for personal fellowship with, with man. Now God knew they had sinned. And God knew that he was their only hope. But God would rescue them on his terms, not theirs. Because of sin, there is now a disconnect from God. And, and they no longer, uh, they could no longer be a part of the paradise style living they had become accustomed to. So they were kicked out of their home. The tree of life was now guarded by cherubims with flaming swords. Sin not only affected their relationship with God, but it also affected their relationship with each other. You know, and now hard work is required to get food. No more just choosing which tree they would eat from today. The serpent, whom they believed, have been reduced to crawling on his belly and eating dust. And they have lost fellowship with God, all because of sin. None of the stuff they were expecting to happen actually happened. Sin is like that. I heard a quote that said that sin will take you farther than you want it to go and keep you longer than you wanted to stay. I, I used to think that, that, w that when they sinned, that the only thing they gained was evil, since they already had good. But then I, I learned that that wasn't so. They, in the garden, in the beginning, they had neither good nor evil before sin. It, it, it was just neutral. Think about it. In order for good to be recognized, it must be measured alongside of sin. There must be something to hold up against 
in order to recognize good. You know, you, you recognize evil, therefore you recognize good. Or you recognize good, and anything that's not good is evil. It's like the way you recognize a counterfeit. It is by first recognizing the real thing. And anything that's not real is counterfeit. So they did not become equal with God. Instead, they became his enemies. Adam and Eve had rebelled against God. They received punishment and was kicked out of the garden. But they were given hope in the midst of their despair. God, it, 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 it's in his character. Hope is just in his character. According to Genesis 3 and 7, when they ate, the first thing that happened is that their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. So once, what once was not a problem for them, in fact, when you think about it, problems didn't even exist, but now they have a problem. And they try to solve it, their problem by sewing fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. You can imagine how ridiculous they looked. That shows that they didn't get wise. They got foolish. God showing them how gracious and merciful he is. And, and also as a foreshadow of his plan to cover sin by, shed, by the shedding of blood, God made them clothing of skin, which caused an animal, animal's blood to be shed. God could have kicked them out looking stupid, trying to hold together some fig leaves. But in his mercy and grace, he covered them. God also gave them hope uh, buried in the curse of the serpent. Genesis 3.15, the King James Version says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This verse has always held a certain amount of mystery for me. You know, one of those things that even though it, it, it's been explained and even though you've read it lots of times, there's still something, some tension like on the inside. Like one of those things that you, you just can't leave alone. To put it another way, have you ever been looking for something and you know it's right before you, but you can't see it. Then it hits you, or rather the Holy Spirit opens open my eyes to at least see a tiny detail of that verse, Me meaning that there are lots more things to see. But he opened my eyes to see just how personal that verse is to God. When God cursed Satan and said, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your heel, your head. Wait a minute. He shall bruise your head, meaning um, Jesus, and you shall bruise his heel. It was as if God was saying, okay, buddy, it's on. You know, kind of like a parent protecting their child. When I was about, uh, I'd say six or seven months pregnant. I, I was pregnant enough to tell with my youngest son. My oldest son was at a playground in the neighborhood. And, you know, I was maybe, you know, three, four houses away, you know, far enough that I could still, I, I had him in my view. Well, another kid that was older than him picked up a stick a, a broken stick and which had a pointed end on it and just started swinging the thing around uh, right in front of my son to hit him. And so without thinking or saying anything, I just jumped up, started running toward that playground. Remember y'all, I'm six or seven months pregnant. And, and, and then to top it off, I could hear my sister yelling at me from behind saying, girl, stop, 
you're pregnant. You're going to hurt yourself. My point is, it's one thing for the bully to mess with the other kids, which is bad. But if he messes with your kid, it becomes personal. God in Genesis 3 and 15 is declaring war on Satan. And, 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 and he's saying on the front end, I have won. He will try to trip me up by going after my feet, but I will crush his head. The message version of Genesis 3 and 15 says, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head. You'll wound his heel. God is saying it's personal. You have messed with what belonged to me. When God made man, he did it in a personal way. For all of creation, he said, let there be, and it was. But for man, he said, let us make man. And to make it even more personal, he said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. That makes it personal. Think about it. When, when we look at our children and our grandchildren and, and see the family image, and likeness that makes it personal God made us in his image according to his likeness his intention before uh, from the beginning was to have a relationship with man and to keep the relationship going when God made woman he took a part of man and placed it in the woman that connected her to the man and them to him. God didn't institute a religious system. He started a relationship. And even though Adam and Eve broke fellowship in the relationship, God is saying in Genesis 3.15, I am not going to leave it like that. I am going to get involved not to build a religious system, but to restore a relationship. God will not just leave us in our brokenness. In due time, he will provide. Well, loved ones, that is all for today. Come back next time as we continue to explore why. Until then, be safe. And God bless. Goodbye.